Hi, this is Samir Bharti and we are here at GitLab Contributive and today we have with us Mark Loveless, your Senior Security Engineer at GitLab. Mm -hmm. So first of all, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. Uh, so this is the first, second day of the event, I think. What has been your experience so far? Uh, it's been interesting. Uh, there's a ton of people here. There's a few that I know. Uh, it's putting faces, actual real faces versus you know, whatever their avatar or icon is. Uh, uh, the big thing is uh, learning how tall everyone is. I, I see a lot of people on Zoom and everyone looks the same height, obviously. Uh, so seeing them in person, you figure out, oh, wow, they're really tall. Yeah. I can relate to that. I'm not very tall. <laughs> and it's also sometimes good to see that, hey, oh, so they're not aliens, actually, because yeah. that's what you... Uh, no, but it's been, it's been really good to, to right. getting to know uh, uh, just people that are strangers, but in a way they're not, because we're all kind of in the same boat. Right. So it's been a lot of fun. Right. And now let's talk about security, which is, you know, your, your core mm -hmm. focus area. Mm -hmm. uh, so first of all, when you look at the cloud native world, where does security fit in there? Uh, it begins immediately, uh, simply because you've got, uh, everything is in motion. There's, there's uh, data going, you know, to the cloud, there's data coming back from the cloud, and it's kind of a, Oh, uh, it stems from originally the way that apps worked. They typically, a long time ago, data was stored on the computer itself. And then as soon as, soon as we have servers, we've got to transfer that data to the server so other people can share it and access to it. And that model has just extended more and more to where now it's going out to uh, this thing, this uh, thing that exists outside the company. Uh, and we're at the point at GitLab where there is no inside the company and outside the company. We're all sort of outside the company because we're essentially, since everyone's remote, we're all essentially cloud-based. And so, and all of the uh, applications that we use, just the day-to-day -day act for doing day-to-day -day activity, the bulk of it is done within uh, uh, the GitLab software itself but we're still using you know whenever we use other applications whether it's uh, we're using slack to communicate or or zoom or, or whatever it is uh, it's still everything is in the cloud and though just so to secure our operations you have to look at you know what security controls we have and then how we can utilize that uh, and make sure that the employees are safe and then what we do and what we generate is also safe. As you mentioned in earlier, you know, it was more, now it's kind of centralized and distributed. When you look at the cloud, uh -huh, you, know, you yes. have more, more influence, more control over your own cloud versus every individual's machine. So how does that change uh, the processes that companies, you know, like GitLab have to use to ensure that everything is secure and also cultural change that comes within the company? Yeah. The one of the problems you have with this is because it becomes very tempting for people uh, who are used to accessing stuff in the cloud. Uh, most of the applications that people use in just for fun, social media, uh, you know, whatnot, uh, their uh, news sites, everything, they're all accessing it from their home computer. And so they're used to using whatever device they want, their home computer, their, their phone, whatever it is. And so there's a lot less emphasis placed upon the endpoint uh, than there was before, uh, simply because of the nature of how uh, the internet is now now evolved. And so a big challenge is, is you've got to put some type of controls in place. So when you have employees accessing uh, you know, company data, that there has to be some level or measure of control over, well, you can't just do this from an insecure device. You can't just do this from you know, a device that's not properly patched up. The old model, back when people had perimeters, is they typically had their work computer and it was managed by work and, and they had complete control over it and they could you know, run inventory on it and everything. And we're having to deal with the fact that there's a, there's a huge uh, uh, bring your own device. The BYOD movement is uh, hugely, uh, 
it's always been there, but it's really come to the forefront in this cloud environment. And so you have to all of a sudden realize there's really not a really good way to strike a balance between the two, you have to start making some hard decisions on uh, how you're going to control your endpoints when it comes to this. And that, that also brings a trust factor as well there somewhere, right? Because you're, you're, you're you know, yeah, you're, e either you trust or you don't trust, you know? The concept of zero trust is the basis of that is, well, I'm not going to trust anything. I'm, there's, there's no perimeter. Uh, I, I need the, uh, the user needs to ensure that when they're talking to what they think is the cloud and they're talking to the resource that it actually is the real resource it's not something fake and the same way that when the user is identifying itself to some component in the cloud it's saying not only am i that person that i claim to be uh, but this device that I'm using is deemed authorized to be able to access that data. So, you're ac so you're, it becomes, I've got to authenticate the person, I've got to authenticate the device, and then that uh, is al then allowed the access. Basically, anywhere Zero Trust becomes anywhere where you make a uh, policy decision, uh, that's essentially uh, where your perimeter exists. And so that, that gives you uh, an immense amount of freedom if you're able to implement that policy everywhere. Because then you can essentially say, and for a company that's remote, that's ideal. Because then you can say, well, you can work from anywhere you want. Uh, uh, you work, work from any network ne or network you want. So if you're on a... Uh, uh, public Wi-Fi. If you're able to actually provide adequate uh, uh, adequate controls and adequate you know software measures, uh, security measures in place, where you can enforce, where you can make and enforce the policy decisions, then people can just work from anywhere and everywhere. And that's that's kind of the uh, the direction that we're we're trying to head. Uh, with the with the whole concept of uh, zero trust. So you kind of talked about the whole evolution, you know, of you know old days, early days to cloud native days. Now I'm more curious about your own evolution. You know, when did you get you know interested in security? Can you talk about your own journey before you joined GitLab, and then why you joined GitLab? Um, I've been interested in security for ages. Okay, uh, several decades at this point. And it wasn't so much, uh, I didn't realize that it was security that I was interested in. I was just wanting to explore and learn more about this electronic world. And so a lot of times it would be, well, whatever it took to get into whatever system it was that I deemed I need to explore, and I would go after it. Now, later on, I might discover that what I was doing was probably illegal. In some cases, things I was doing so early on, there weren't even laws against that. There became laws against it later on. But nonetheless, after a while, you begin to learn that, okay, well, there's kind of a, a, a technological niche area that I'm exploring here that is totally tied up in security. And most of it for me was more problem solving just with a security uh, thing to it. Maybe it's just like looking at the world a little bit differently, like looking at something and instantly saying, I think I can spot a flaw in that, or I think I could make that do something it wasn't intended to do. And so that kind of started my career as a, a researcher. Uh, uh, I did it uh, as a hobby for probably a good decade, and then I started doing it professionally uh, probably uh, uh, two decades ago. And then did you join GitLab, and why? I jo well, I joined GitLab uh, simply because I, you know, the, the person that's my boss, Kathy, uh, I knew her from a couple of decades ago when I started into this whole, uh, whole industry, and she saw that I was... Uh, going on a, uh, 
uh, fun employment uh, uh, portion of my life, I decided to take some time off after leaving my uh, last job. And uh, she just said, oh, I'm working here. Hey, haven't, haven't talked to you in a while. What you're up to? See you're unemployed. You know, what do you think? And I looked over the, I started, I looked over the handbook to start with. And it, um, at first it, it was kind of horrifying because I was thinking, oh my gosh, they're putting the whole company out here online. This is crazy. I'm a security guy. I know that's, there must be all kinds of problems. But then I started really deep diving into it, really reading through a lot of it. It's like, no, this makes so much sense. This is very open. This is the way you're going to do things. And from a security perspective, it's even more interesting because it meant that uh, if there were security elements, let's say that there's some type of issue or problem where we wanted to communicate in detail, uh, there would be no problem communicating it in detail. Uh, Whereas at other companies where I've worked where they've reported security issues or, or something like that, they've tried to kind of hide it and hide, you know, hide the details to make themselves look better. And I always thought that's not the way you do this. If you're open and explain things, and then that's, that's the way to go. Seeing that uh, GitLab uh, participates with the, uh, uh, heavily with the uh, HackerOne uh, bug bounty program was a, another factor in that. Just like, well, obviously they want to do everything they can to make make their product better. And everything I'm reading with this, this is the right direction to head. And being 100% remote was great. I've worked remote for the past two decades. And so to actually come to a company where everyone else is working remote is great. That was uh, another big factor there simply because there was never a point where uh, as a remote person, I, would, I knew I would never experience that thing. It's like, oh yeah, that problem we were working on? Yeah, we solved that at lunch. Or we solved that at the, uh, in the break room uh, when you weren't around. Sorry you didn't have any input on that decision. No, no this, everything is there. You get to participate, participate fully and everything. So that's just, that's just wonderful. Uh, before we wrap this interview, I just want to talk about, but you said, you know, you started your professional career as a hobby. So I don't want to ask about your hobbies. I'm sure they are either dangerous or illegal. <laughs> but, <laughs> but what are your hobbies? Well, uh, so, yeah, I, I try to, I've, I've, I've tried to curtail my uh, criminal career, <laughs> my unintentional criminal career. Uh, no, it's my main hobbies are uh, right now. I, I enjoy woodworking. I, I do the, I do a lot of that. Uh, I still do a lot of playing around with tech in other capacities. Uh, so uh, you know, so I, I still do that as a hobby, which frankly doesn't make sense because it's what I do for my day job as well. So, but uh, I say probably the big one is probably woodworking. Yeah. So once your your hobby becomes your work, you're never working actually. So. Yeah. I mean that's the thing when I when I was taking my time off. Uh, for my short amount of time that I took my time off, uh, it, I was I was still working. I was still doing research. I was still writing blogs, you know, putting out videos, doing the whole doing the whole bit. Yeah. You know, so it was just I just enjoy doing that kind of thing. Right, and that's the case with me also. You know, my work is my hobby, so my wife always complains. You're always working. I say no. I'm always having fun. I'm never actually working. Yeah. So I say yeah, but yeah, but it's mainly mainly it's been woodworking and also music. I do a lot of. Oh. Uh, do a lot of music as well. So next year we might see you in the band. For the <laughs> uh, maybe we'll see. I'm a I'm a metalhead, as you probably have already guessed. It seems obvious, really, when you think about it, that I would be a metalhead. So, uh, yeah, if there's a if there's a GitLab metal band, I'm there. Awesome, Mark. Uh, it was nice talking to you today. Yeah, and good talking to you. I look forward to seeing you again. Thank All you. Right, you bet.